Hi there, welcome to the philosophy of language half of mind and language. Uh, th so this first lecture, um, lecture video, I'm going to give you uh, a little bit of an overview of what we're doing in this half of the module. And then we're going to get into your first major reading, which is the, the Grice reading um, about, uh, so this isn't in the title, but the, the central concept I want you to get out of this is conversational implicature. Okay, to some extent, what we're going to do today, what you're going to learn in the in the Grice reading kind of stands to one side from the rest of the stuff we're going to read on this half of the module. In a sense, um, all of the people that we read after reading Grice, um, beginning with Frege, and then we're going to read Russell and Strassen and Donnellan and Quine and Saul, um, those people are all, in a sense, having the same conversation with each other. They're all talking to each other about um, certain questions uh, about the, let's say, semantics of natural language. We will talk later in the video about what semantics means here. Um, whereas Grice is talking about something slightly different. Okay. Let me frame it this way. What we're concerned with in philosophy of language, or maybe I should say in the parts of philosophy of language that we're going to talk about in this module, because it's, as you might expect, a much bigger field than we could really capture in five or six weeks or however many uh, we actually have. What we're, what we're interested in this corner of philosophy of language is something like the most general possible question about how language works, what we can do with language, why it is the way it is, uh, that sort of thing. We're not interested so much in specifically English or German or Polish or French or any other specific language. Oh, those were all European, whatever. Anyway, um, but we're interested in like how language works in general, like fundamentally. How is it possible that, for example, certain sounds that I might make with like this part, this part of my body um, can mean things. What is that meaning relation? Or questions like, um, is there anything that all human languages have in common? Is there anything that, I mean, what is it for something to be a language as opposed to, I don't know, something else? Like maybe paintings represent things or have meaning, and maybe that's different from languagey ways of meaning things. Okay, so all of the people that we're going to look at in this class um, are interested in that big picture kind of question. How fundamentally, most broadly, most generally, does language work? Grice is going to be interested in a slightly different kind of answer to that question. He's going to be saying, um, he's going to say in the paper that you're going to read uh, that all these questions about semantics, and again, we'll get onto what semantics means, uh, miss something, miss something fundamental about how language works, things that we can do with language, things that you would expect any language to be able to do. Okay. That's just sort of broad framing. That's a why are we here kind of thing. Let's get into the details. Okay. Um, I, I also want to say when you're reading the Grice, um, here's something I expect you might experience reading it um, that I think is probably not unusual for readings in, um, in philosophy when you're still an undergraduate. Um, when you start reading the paper, when you get in at the beginning and, you know, in the parts where you would expect Grice to be telling you, here's why we're doing the thing we're doing, that might not make a lot of sense. I will have something to say later on in this lecture about um, what that stuff is about. At the very end of this lecture, I will tell you about what that sort of opening and closing stuff is about, what sort of debates he thinks he's inter in intervening in. Um, you might find yourself lost on that stuff. That's okay. What I want you to do is do your best. Um, try to identify the parts where you're where you get confused. Like if you can say I follow him up to here, then like highlight or underline or put an arrow at the part where you're like I don't know what he's talking about here. Um, ask me those questions if you like. But I want you to press on because the important stuff, the the stuff that I mainly want you to get here, um, is in the the sort of the middle of the paper. And this is where he, um, it's it's sort of in the middle that he identifies this thing, conversational implicature. Okay, so let's get started. What is conversational implicature? I want to start by giving you some examples. Um, oh, sorry, I should also mention, um, I think Grice is doing two things, two things in his identification of conversational implicature as a thing um, uh, worth studying. Um, number one is he identifies it and he says, here's the sort of thing that these other philosophers of language have not noticed, haven't explicitly talked about. And number two, he gives us, I'm trying to put this somewhere where it's not, 
in the way of my mouth. Number two, um, he uh, gives us a theory about how conversational implicature works. So you might be with him on point one. You might say, ah, yes, I recognize this as a thing that happens. Um, but you might disagree with his theory about how that works. So he's going to say, here's a thing, and then he's going to try to explain the thing. His explanation is um, fairly standard still today, broadly speaking, um, but it's more controversial than point one, the identification of the phenomenon. So let's just start with examples. Okay, so I'm going to give you um, dialogues, very short dialogues, just exchanges between two people. So person A asks person B, um, th these examples are from the before times when there were pubs. Uh, person A asks, are you coming to the pub? Person B replies, I've got an early class tomorrow morning. Okay, what I want you to think about, uh, probably don't need much thinking, is... So, so when B has said this, has B answered the question? Is A going to say, hey, like, who asked about your class? I asked if you're coming to the pub. I think we can agree. I, I hope you would agree. B has said, no, I'm not coming to the pub. And yet B hasn't said anything about going to the pub, hasn't said anything about what they're doing now. They've told you about something else entirely. Okay. I'll give you another example. Um, person A says, doesn't ask a question this time, just says, oh, I'm so hungry. Person B says, I've got some crisps. Okay. All person B has said is something about what they have. I have lots of things. Um, but I hope you'll agree. Uh, person B has pretty clearly communicated, you can have some of my crisps. Here's something that will help with the hunger you've just reported. Okay. Let me give you a couple more. Person A asks, where's Connor? Person B says, uh, he's either at the bar or in the toilet. Okay. This time we've got somebody who has given something that's clearly an answer to the question. Right. They've said something about uh, where Connor is. He's in one place or the other. Um, but something I think they've still clearly communicated, although they haven't said it, is um, I don't know which of those places he's in. Right. He's in one place or the other, and I don't know which. Okay. Um, last example. If somebody says, this time without a dialogue, just when somebody says something like, um, some of our lecturers are Scottish. I think this clearly communicates in many contexts, not necessarily all of them, in many contexts, an assertion like this, if you say some of our lecturers are Scottish, um, that communicates, although you haven't said it, that not all of our lecturers are Scottish. Okay, we'll come back to that. Okay, what all these things have in common is that there's, we can contrast what's said, if you like, what's literally been said um, by uh, the, the last person to speak in each case with something further that they've communicated, something further they've clearly communicated. And that further thing we'll call an implicature. So this is, this is an odd word. You might think, isn't the word supposed to be like implication or something? Um, Grice is intentionally using um, a strange word. He's trying to say this is like an implication, but different. So in uh, logic class or in like your intro philosophy class is in first year. Um, when we talk about uh, valid arguments, we'll sometimes say, yeah, so if an argument is valid, then its premises imply the conclusion or the conclusion is an implication of the premises. So Grice wants something that's like that relationship, uh, but different. It's not the same. So that, that's why you get this awkward word, uh, word. So we say implicature instead of implication. We say implicate instead of imply. This is the terminology. It is now standard. Okay, so there's a contrast between what is said and an implicature. So in this case, all that's been said is that at least some of our lectures are Scottish. That's what's been said. Um, but there's a further implication that not all of our lectures are Scottish. If we say uh, Connor's either in the bar or in the toilet, the person hasn't said anything, at least in this literal sense of what they've said. He hasn't said, I don't know which. He's just said Connor's in one or one or the other of these places. But there's a, Bryce will say, an implicature 
he's implicated that he doesn't know anything further. B. Say, I should say. I don't know if B isn't a distinctly masculine name. Um, when you say I've got some crisps, all you've said is something about what you have, but you've implicated this further thing about um, how I can help your hunger problem. Um, and likewise for uh, this one. All you've said is something about your schedule in the morning, but you've implicated you're not coming to the bar. Or that like if you are, you're going to leave earlier, something like that. Okay, so we've got this first distinction. Let's start here between what is said and implicature. But notice the thing that I'm putting in the title up here is conversational implicature. So there's more than one kind of implicature, according to Grice. Um, the following is a little bit controversial, more controversial than the rest of the picture. But let me give you this distinction. So there's conversational implicature. That's the main thing that we're interested in. And I'll tell you what that is in a second. And then there's what he calls conventional implicature. Um, what's the sense of convention? What's, what, what does conventional mean in this case? What's the sense of convention we're talking about? So think about it this way. Conventions are um, as a first pass. Uh, conventions are things that we just sort of like agree um, uh, socially. We like agree that this is how things are going to work. Um, so like in this country, there is a convention of uh, driving cars on the left hand side of the street. In other countries, there's a convention of driving cars on the right hand side of the street. Why is it true that um, you must drive on the left hand side of the street in this country? Uh, because that's what all the people here agree that they're going to do. Why does it? Why do you have to drive on the right hand side of the street um, in North America? Um, because that's what all the people there agree that you're going to do. Maybe there's something else about laws, but there's something fundamentally about like this is true because it's how we agree that it's going to work. Now, importantly, um, that the, there's also something fundamentally conventional about any specific language that you're interested in. Why does um, why does the sound uh, red mean? certain color. Oh wait, I should have picked a color of a thing that I can see here. Um, here, I have a red pen. Why does the color, sorry, why does the sound red mean that color? Uh, because in English we agree that those sounds will mean that thing. That's the whole story. Um, the fact that there might be a story about why we agree on that. Maybe it's related to previous agreements that other people have had in other cases. Maybe for some words there's like a, an onomatopoeia type reason for why certain sounds mean certain things. Um, but fundamentally, the thing that makes it the case that those sounds in this language mean that thing is that the speakers of this language agree that it does. Other languages have other things. That's fine. So the kind of conventional, uh, the kind of conventionality involved in conventional implicature is the same kind of convention that makes it the case that certain sounds or certain letters in English in a certain order mean a certain thing. What's an example of this, of, sorry, of a conventional implicature? So something where you go beyond what's said, you get something further that's implicated, but the reason why is just a matter of convention. Grice's example is the difference between and and but. So he thinks if we look at just the truth conditions, just like what it would take for a sentence A and B to be true compared with a sentence A but B, well, in both cases, you need both of those things to be true. You need A to be true, you need B to be true. If either of those things is not true, then the whole sentence A and B is not true. The whole sentence A but B is not true. Um, but Grice says, when you use the word but instead of and, there's a conventional implicature um, of something like the following, that, that B contrasts with A, or B is surprising given A, or something like that. So think of a sentence like this, um, Emma is hungry, but she won't stay for supper. Um, that, that I, I think sounds kind of sensible, right? Um, imagine a context where Emma is visiting your house one day. Um, a context where Emma is visiting your house like late in the afternoon, and uh, there's a question, is Emma going to stay for supper? Well, she's hungry, but she won't stay. She would like to eat, but she won't. There's, there's a contrast, right? The hunger would give you some reason to expect she might want to stay. On the other hand, if you say something like this, Emma is hungry, but she will stay for supper. That sounds kind of funny, right? It sounds like the speaker thinks there's a contrast between saying Emma is hungry and saying that she will stay for supper, but there isn't really a contrast. 
so so this sounds a little bit funny, but Grice is going to say, as long as it's true that Emma's hungry and true that Emma will stay for supper, this sentence is still going to come out true. So if we're just thinking about the semantics, about um, what's been said in a, in uh, a way that makes a difference to whether the sentence is true or false, taken, let's say, literally or strictly at its word, A and B, A but B, he thinks are going to be the same. But when you choose the word but instead of and, that gives you this difference between uh, what feels normal about the first sentence and what feels funny about the second sentence. Okay. He also thinks that's just like part of the meaning of the word but. That's just part of how we English speakers have agreed that the word but is going to work. Um, okay, I want to put that to one side. Um, partly because it's not Grice's main interest, and also partly because uh, the existence of conventional implicature is controversial among linguists. Uh, conversational implicature is, I think, universally agreed to be a real thing. Um, but whether there's any such thing as conventional impl implicature is controversial. So let's just put that to one side. So the thing we want to explain is conversational implicature. How we're going to get a grip on what's different between conversational and Conventional, um, there are two ways we could do it. One way is by looking at Grice's theory about how conversational implicature works. I will get to that. Um, but first, he gives us certain um, characteristics of conversational implicature. He says all conversational implicatures have these properties. They are cancelable and maybe sometimes reinforceable. They are non-detachable non and they are calculable. I'm going to explain what each of these things means in turn. And I want you to think about um, the examples that we started with um, and any other examples you can think of. I bet you can think of other examples of cases where somebody might literally say one thing that implicates, that clearly communicates another. Um, back in the old days when I could give these lectures face to face, I'd usually ask students to come up with examples and regularly you do. So I think that you um, current students would also be able to do this anyway. Okay, so let's let's see what each of these things mean. These are tests, or these are, sorry, properties of conversational implicatures that Grice asserts will always be there. I'm going to tell you what they are, and I want you then to think about how they apply to these examples that we've done and any other examples you can come up with yourself. And tell me about it if you like. So start with cancelability and reinforceability. So both of these things, cancel, canceling and reinforcing, um, involve taking the original sentence that somebody said, the thing... Uh, that has an implicature, the thing that communicates something further, and thinking about ways that we can uh, say something else after it and see what happens when you do that. So here's an example of canceling an implicature. If I say Connor's at the bar or in the toilet, that's what I said before, and then I go on to say, and I know which one. So remember, before we said, if I say Connor's at the bar or in the toilet, I was implicating that I don't know more specifically where he is. I can cancel that implicature by, by explicitly saying the denial of it. So I can say Connor's at the bar or in the toilet, I go on to say, and I do know which one he's in. So here's the test. So that's the, adding that extra thing at the end where I deny the thing that was implicated before. That's uh, attempting to cancel the implicature, right? Because if I just said this thing by itself, then I'd be implicating this further thing. If I add in the denial, that's canceling it. The test for, um, or, or sorry, the, the cancelability characteristic of conversational implicatures is that usually when you do this kind of canceling, it doesn't sound contradictory. Might sound a little surprising, but it's totally possible for this thing that I've said to be true. I don't sound like I've literally contradicted myself. Let's try this again. If I say some of our lecturers are Scottish, I can go on to cancel the implicature. Remember, the implicature was all of our lecturers are Scottish. I can say some of our lecturers are Scottish, but not all of them. This is re I've mixed up my slides. Here's the canceling one. Some of our lecturers are Scottish. In fact, all of them are. That's canceling. So I said, you can also try reinforcing. The cancelability test is try saying the thing denying the um, implicated extra bit that's communicated. If that doesn't sound contradictory, then you're okay. Reinforcing, here's the reinforcement test. Say the initial thing and then go on to actually say the part that was implicated before. If that doesn't sound redundant, 
that doesn't sound like you've just said something you've already said. That shows that the implicature was reinforceable. So some of our lecturers are Scottish, but not all of them. That to me sounds like a totally normal sentence. You judge for yourself. Um, those of you who are native speakers of English, judge for yourself whether that sounds right in English. Those of you who are native speakers of another language, um, this is not supposed to be a specifically English phenomenon. So try to think of examples in your, in your native tongue. Okay. So conversational implicatures are supposed to be uh, cancelable and uh, probably also reinforceable. So you should be able to say the thing that has an implicature and then deny the implicated thing without contradicting yourself. That's cancelability. You should be able to say the thing that has the implicature and then actually say the implicature, the implicated thing, and not sound redundant. That's the reinforceability test. Okay. Here's the contrast with the reinforceability that we had before. If I say some of our lecturers are Scottish, but not none of them, that sounds redundant. That's this redundancy test that we had before. Some of our lecturers are Scottish, but not none of them. Just That just sounds like I don't know what I said the first time. Why do I think that I need to tell you not none? Of, I, already, I already said that. So notice there's a difference between the relationship between sentence A, some of our lecturers are Scottish, and then the thing it implicates, namely, um, not all of them are Scottish, versus something that is just like a valid consequence, an entailment, an implication of it. Namely, uh, it's not the case that none of our lecturers are Scottish. So saying some of our lecturers are Scottish, but not none, that sounds redundant. That shows that this kind of thing can't be reinforced. Whereas the implicated thing can be reinforced. I hope that's clear. I'm going to move on. Okay, next characteristic, non-detachability. Okay, this is Grice's phrase. I think it's a little confusing um, often. So what's the idea here? The idea of non-detachability is something like this. If you have a sentence that seems to implicate something, try another sentence that says the same thing and you should still get the implicature. So the idea is when you have a conversational implicature, it's not because of the specific way that you said it. It's because of the thing you were saying. It's because of what you were communicating. So here are some examples. So suppose instead of saying some of our lecturers are Scottish, I say at least a few of our lecturers are Scottish. Bryce thinks you should still get the same conversational implicature. This should still implicate that not all of my lecturers are Scottish. Likewise, if I say some of our lecturers are from Scotland, the fact that I said are Scottish versus are from Scotland, still same. Um, or like there are Scottish lecturers at this university. Here are, so here are, so we've got now four different ways of saying some of our lecturers are Scottish. All of them should have the implicature. Why is that something you would call non-detachability? I, I don't worry about it. I find that unintuitive also. Every year I have to remind myself, why is it? What are we detaching? What? Um, I guess you can't detach the implicature by changing the way you say the thing. Yeah, whatever. Um, this is a little bit more um, controversial. I think. Um, I guess we have to have some way of deciding whether these sentences all literally say the same thing. Maybe they're a bit different. Um, but Grice thinks it's a characteristic of conversational implicature, and it's a characteristic that would be predicted by his theory. We're going to get to that in a moment. So, oh yeah, here we go. Here's an explanation uh, for myself. The impl implicature can't be detached from the sentence, I guess, by rephrasing it in different ways. So here we are. This is the basic idea. The implicature arises because of what you said, not because of how you said it. Here are different ways of saying the same thing, but the implicature arises, conversational implicatures arise from what you say, not because of how you say it. Okay. Finally, calculability. What does this mean? Here's the idea, uh, quoting directly from Grice. The presence of a conversational implicature must be capable of being worked out, or even if it can in fact be intuitively grasped, unless the intuition is replaceable by an argument, the implicature, if present at all, if there is an implicature at all, will not count as a conversational implicature, it will be a conventional implicature. So what's this working out? Well, he's got a theory, or he told you there'd be a theory, this is our transition point, he's got a theory about how this sort of argument or calculation works. Um, 
So I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you the theory, and that's going to tell you about um, how people work out um, the presence of conversational implicature, even if they don't um, just sort of immediately see it. Um, and that will explain what this feature of calculability is. So here's the basic structure of his explanation. He's going to say um, there are certain maxims, there are certain principles that govern cooperative um, communicative exchanges. Um, there's, uh, there's a central maxim and there are a bunch of sub maxims that sort of explain things in more detail. But the basic picture is going to be um, when we communicate with each other, when we try to cooperate and having a conversation is one kind of trying to cooperate, uh, we all assume that everybody involved is cooperating, that we are trying to work together. And if you take sort of that as a premise, plus another premise that says the person said such and such in this conversation, then Grice thinks you should be able to put those things together and reason your way to like figuring out why they said the thing they said. And it's going to tell you, oh, they must have wanted to communicate this extra other thing. And the extra other thing is going to be your implicature. Okay, so here's how I'm going to proceed from here. I'm going to tell you about the maxims and we're going to try and apply them to cases. So the central maxim is his cooperative principle, which he states like this. Make your, the, the maxim, so principle, this instruction says, make your conversational contribution such as is required at the stage at which it occurs by the accepted purpose or direction of the talk exchange in which you are exchanged, it, it, engaged. So, yeah, that's very, very broad. Um, maybe, it, maybe let's just jump right into sub maxim. So, Grice comes up with these four. Um, he calls them quantity, quality, relation, and manner. I'll explain each one in turn in a moment. Um, you might be a little bit suspicious of this dividing up into four maxims, partly because um, Grice is self-consciously like playing on. Uh, this is sort of a almost like a philosophical pun. Um, he says he's playing on, he's riffing on Kant. I guess Kant has a thing where there's like four kinds of qualities of judgment or something. I don't know Kant as well as I should. Should I admit that in public? I don't know Kant as well as I should, but I guess Kant has a thing where there's like um, human uh, judgment or reasoning or something like that involves um, uh, things about quantity, quality, um, relation, and mode. I think those are the ones. So, okay, you might think this is not carving nature at the joints. This is um, Grice picking these four sub maxims in order to sound like Kant, um, who was not thinking about the same kind of phenomena that Grice is. So you might think maybe there are other maxims that explain other things, um, or maybe these are weird ways of carving things up, but they have become pretty standard. Um, people do, uh, uh, you can look around for contemporary linguists and philosophers of language who um, will uh, offer different maxims, but you might initially suspect there are going to be other ones. So, okay, let's start with quantity. Quantity, here's what he says. Um, the quantity maxim says, make your contribution, so the thing that you say, make your contribution as informative as is required for the current purposes of this exchange. Um, and maybe another part of, max, the, of the maxim, which he's a little more doubtful about, um, don't make your contribution more informative than is required. So we've got one that says, make, definitely make sure that you're giving at least as much information as is required. And another one in the other direction, sort of pushing downward saying, don't give more information than people ask for. Um, yeah, you know what? I'm just gonna get all these maxims on the table and then we'll uh, see how we can apply them to cases. So, okay, this one is saying, give uh, at least as much information as is required. And maybe we'll also say, don't give too much extra information. Quality maxim says this is not about how much information to give, but instead try to make your contribution one that's true. That's the kind of quality we're interested in. We can think of two sub maxims. I guess these are sub sub maxims now um, explaining what it means to try to make your contribution one that is true. Don't say what you believe to be false and don't say that for which you lack adequate evidence. So if you, if you are, uh, if you do have an opinion about whether the thing is true or not, and your opinion is that it's not true, don't say it. On the other hand, if you even if you don't have an opinion about whether the thing is true or not, but you don't think you have good enough evidence, maybe this is why you don't have an opinion about 
whether it's true or not, then don't say it. Okay. Maxim of relation. Be relevant. So say something that's related to what people are talking about, what's going on in this talk exchange. So if we are talking um, about philosophy of language. Don't start telling me about, I don't know, economics or chemistry or um, Justin Bieber. It's a strange thing to do. Try to talk about the thing that we're talking about. The maximum of manner, briefly put, he says, be perspicuous, which maybe is uh, an unperspicuous way of saying what you want to say, because perspicuous is not a word that people use a lot. Um, do something that makes the... the uh, the thing that you're trying to communicate stand out. Make it easy to pick out. Yeah, make it clear. How about that? Sub-maxims, explaining what we mean by be perspicuous. Avoid obscurity of ex expression. Don't use... E so if you've got, like, two words that both mean the thing you want to communicate, and one of them is uh, uh, a word that everybody uses and everybody knows, and the other is not, use the first word. Um, if you have a synonym for perspicuous that you expect all of your readers to know, use that instead of using the word perspicuous. Avoid ambiguity. Okay, so if... So ambiguity... Um, I, I think this might get used loosely in a lot of different ways, sort of popularly. Um, the the ambi prefix here is the same as the ambi prefix in the word ambidextrous. So ambidextrous people are ones who... Um, are neither right-handed nor left-handed. Um, etymologically, this is something like ambi, both dexterous, right. So ambidextrous people have two right hands. Their left hand is as good as their right hand. Um, ambiguity, the, the ambi here means both, or two, or something like that. An ambiguous expression or phrase or whatever is something that has two meanings. So if you say something that, if you're, if you're trying to get one meaning across, uh, don't say something that has that meaning and also another possible meaning. You want to make sure that people get the right one. Okay, avoid ambiguity. Be brief. Avoid unnecessary prolixity. Prolixity, there's another one of those obscure words. That means going on long. Notice that this maxim, the statement of it, you might think um, is unnecessarily prolix. That is, could have just said be brief and ended the sentence there. But then he's added a further explanation. Avoid unnecessary prolixity. That seems like it's just repeating what we said before. So this word is, this sentence is five words when it could have been two. So it's violating that maxim. Okay, be orderly. Don't, so if you've got a bunch of information to give me, put it in a, 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 a structure that makes sense instead of just sort of giving it randomly. Um, why? Because you want to be perspicuous. You want your meaning to stand out. You want it to be easy for people to pick out. Okay. Those are our maxims. Here's how a lot of the time, um, hmm, let me back up a second. I was going to start telling you about failing to obey a maxim. Sometimes you're going to be able to calculate a, um, so, the, sorry, the typical case is you're going to be able to calculate, that is, uh, reason your way to discovering that there is an implicature by assuming that the person you're speaking to is obeying the maxims to the best of their ability. So assuming at the, at the highest level, assuming that they're being cooperative, you might look at something that they've said and think, this is not as cooperative as it could be. Why? And you might be able to reason to what's the best explanation or the most likely explanation of why they would say something like this when some other thing would be more helpful. Or at a lower level, you might see like, oh, they've said something that violates the maximum of, let's say, quantity. Um, they haven't given me as much information as, as I want. And you might reason, well, that's just one of four sub-maxims. Probably because my partner in this talk exchange is cooperating to the best of their ability, the reason why they're violating the maximum of quantity and not giving me as much information as I want must be because if they satisfied the maximum of quantity and gave me as much information as I want, they'd be violating some of the other maxims. So maybe there's another maxim that they're trying to obey, um, like uh, maybe the maxim of um, quality. You might say, this person hasn't given me as much information as I want. I want to know where Connor is precisely so I can walk up to him and slap him. And they've just told me he's in one of two places. That's not enough information. Where do I go to slap Connor? Um, you might then think to yourself, well, maybe this person who's talking to me 
If they told me one location, they would be violating the maxim of quality. That is, they would either be lying, saying something they believe to be false, or they would be saying something they don't have adequate evidence for. Like if all they know is Connor's in one of these two places, then they would just tell me that. And that gets you, that chain of reasoning gets you to the implicature. Okay, so typically conversational implicatures, the way that you're going to calculate them, the way you're going to reason your way to the presence of conversational implicature is by assuming that the person who spoke is following the maxims. When they fail to, the thing that they say fails to follow all of the maxims, fails to follow one or more of the maxims, then you reason it must be because the person is trying to obey the other ones. What's going on? Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is different ways of failing to obey a maxim. And Grice is going to say there, there are different ways that we can do this. Okay, so Grice is going to say there are four different ways, four different ways you can fail to fulfill a maxim. First of all, you might uh, merely violate the maxim, as he puts it, unostentatiously, without drawing attention to yourself or anything like that. Um, this might even happen, like, by accident. Um, for example, I think I have probably violated uh, these two norms, be brief and be orderly, quite a bit in this video because I uh, have too many words, not because I'm trying to, but just because talking short is hard. Um, and maybe you would like the things that I say to be more ordered. Um, but you're not going to get any um, conversational implicatures out of that, as we will see in a second. So Grice does say, when you merely violate a maxim unostentatiously, you may be liable to mislead people. So you might just be misspeaking. You might not be fully in control of what you're doing. What else might you do? You might opt out of a maxim. So his example is if you say, um, I cannot say more. My lips are sealed. If somebody asks you a question, you say, I, I plead the fifth. I'm not going to answer that. That's opting out of the maxim of quantity. The maximum of quantity is saying, give us at least as much information as is required. I might just say, tell you I'm not going to do that. That's not necessarily going to get you a conversational implicature. Um, on the other hand, you might be faced with a clash of maxims. That's going to be, in a lot of cases, um, how we get conversational implicatures, right? So if um, somebody says something to you that fails to obey a maxim, you might reason and think they're trying to cooperate. The reason they're violating this thing is because they were faced with a clash. That was the kind of story that I gave um, a few seconds ago. Uh, finally, he says, you might flout a maxim. So you might like ostentatiously uh, draw attention to um, how much you are violating the thing. So maybe sometimes when you say things that are just totally obviously false and completely ridiculous, maybe that gets people to think um, you might mean something else. Or maybe when you um, go on and on and on with all kinds of information at great length um, when you could have done otherwise. That might um, get you a conversational implicature. Um, Grice has an example in the paper, um, I find it amusing, uh, about somebody reviewing an opera singer's performance. Take a look at that. I'll leave it to you to read. Um, okay, so let's come back to why we were talking about these maxims. This was our thing about uh, calculability. Right, says the presence of a conversational implicature must be capable of being worked out, or even if it can in fact be intuitively grasped, unless the intuition is replaceable by an argument, the implicature, if present at all, will not will not count as a conversational implicature. It will be a conventional implicature. Notice, importantly, he is not saying that. Um, so I said the the way conversational implicature works in his theory is there are these kinds of arguments about maxims. He is not saying that um, you do in fact um, work through these arguments. He's saying it must be capable of being worked out. So you might immediately hear, uh, so if I say like, I'm, uh, you ask me, can, can you come to the pub? Not that people ask me that, but you might ask somebody interesting, can you come to the pub? And they say, um, I've got to work early in the morning. Grace isn't saying you're then going to sort of sit down with pencil and paper and say, well, according to the maximum of uh, uh, relation. Uh, this must be something relevant to what I was thinking, uh, but it doesn't seem to be relevant. So how could this possibly be relevant? Well, the best explanation is et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You might just intuitively work it out. But the, the important thing for him is that it must be possible to work it out. We must be able to give an explanation in terms of the maxims, in terms of a kind of reasoning you could um, do, starting from the cooperative principle, assuming that the person is trying to follow the cooperative principle. 
um, and getting to um, the idea that they're trying to communicate something further. If you cannot replace an implicature by um, such an argument, then uh, if you have an implicature at all, it's a conventional one. Okay. So what is this sort of argument going to look like? I want you to work through these examples. I've talked to you about some of them. So here are the examples we started with. Somebody asks, are you coming to the pub? B says, I've got an early class tomorrow morning. What they've said is this thing. What they've implicated is this further thing. I want you to think about uh, what maxims are they violating, if any, by saying the thing that they said. Um, what kind of violation is it? Is it um, a merely unostentatiously violating? Is it opting out? Is it um, being faced with a clash? Or is it flouting? Uh, third, what's the best explanation that somebody like A would be able to come up with for why they said this thing? And, and essentially, how do you get from the, the premise that B said this thing and the further premise that they are doing their, that B is doing their best to follow the cooperative principle and the other maxim and then get to the conclusion that they wanted to communicate this further thing i don't intend to come to the pub likewise when a says i'm so hungry b says i've got some crisps the implicature here is you can have some of my crisps um, what uh what maxims are they violating what kind of violation uh what's the how would we reason from um what they've said Via the, via the maxims and assumption of the um, conversational uh, cooperate, cooperative principle to the conclusion that they're trying to say, you can have some of my crisps. When you say, where's Connor? I've given, you, I've given you a version of this. Make sure you feel like you can recite it. How do we get from what, they, what B said to what they implicated? And finally, same for some of our lecturers are Scottish, getting to the implicature, not all of our lecturers are Scottish. Okay, I want you to work through those things for yourself. That's if you if you just get those things you're in you're in good shape. Um, I think conversational implicature is a useful um, a useful tool for humans to have. Um, some of the things that we teach you we teach you because philosophy students should know them. Conversational implicature I think it's just a thing that like all humans should know because it's just an advance. But let me bring this back to the how Grice relates to the rest of what we've got on this module and the way that he um, introduces the paper. So here's a thought you might have had uh, while learning logic, if you took logic class with me, and if you didn't, try to imagine that you did. Um, so here's something that we remarked on earlier when we were talking about conventional implicature. Um, there's no difference, at least in the uh, formal logical language that you would have learned in uh, first year logic, TFL, truth functional logic. Um, there's no difference in TFL between the sentences A and B a but b both have the logical form a and b this this wedge here this upside down v is the that's the symbol that we use in uh, tfl for and so in a language that only cares about which of those uh, uh, whether whether a sentence is true or false and under what circumstances it would be true or false the sentence a and b and the sentence a but b look exactly the same okay that's a first observation so you might think, here are things you could think about the, that logical language. Either TFL is defective because it doesn't capture what's going on in natural language. That is, in English, there is a difference between this sentence and this one. But in TFL, there's no difference. So that's a problem for TFL if it's trying to capture English. Or English is defective. Natural language is defective because it makes a distinction that isn't there. So you might think, the logical language is the superior one, right? When you when you look under the surface, what's what's happening under the bonnet is this thing with a just a, an upside down V in it. And really this sentence and this one are the same. And when we think that they're different, we're just misleading ourselves. Um, this, in broad strokes, you might see um, Russell and Strawson, Strawson and Russell on the um, two sides of this when we get on to read them. You can come back to it if you like. but. Here's what Grice is going to say. This is the, you guys are missing a more important point. Neither natural language nor TFL is defective. The two sentences do have the same truth conditions, but they differ in what they implicate, what they conventionally implicate. So he's going to say, 
something like this, if we're thinking about semantics, if we're just thinking about truth conditions, if we're just thinking about what is said, then we might say there's no difference between the two sentences. They are true in exactly the same circumstances. They're false in exactly the same circumstances, but they differ in what they implicate. So aside from what is said, we can ask about what they further communicate, what they suggest, if you like, what they implicate. Uh, A but B carries this further implication, it, sorry, not implication, implicature, that there's a, a contrast between B and A. The sentence A and B doesn't carry that. TFL, truth functional logic, is not trying to capture that. It's just trying to do semantics. So if you like, Grice is saying there is more to language than just semantics, and we can pay attention to it, and we can, um, you know, carefully study it. Here's another thought you might have while learning logic. Um, this is also something that uh, Grice brings up. So truth functional logic symbolizes the sentence A or B as, so this, the, the V sign, that's our symbol for or. Um, but the TFL connective V is inclusive, whereas English or is often exclusive. What's the difference? So inclusive or, when I say A or B in the inclusive sense, I'm saying either A is true or B is true or both. So if both of them are true, um, then the inclusive or will still be true. Exclusive or says just one of these two things is true, not both. Okay. The connective that we learn in uh, introductory logic um, that's standardly used in um, the, the, the kind of logic that handles these sorts of truth functional connectives, Boolean connectives, if you like, uh, usually treats them treats the or as inclusive. Okay, so here's something you might think. This is another mismatch between our formal logical language and natural language. Here's another contrary thought, though. Grice will say, the English sentence A or B has the same truth conditions as TFL's A, V, B. However, we can use a sentence of that form in context to communicate an exclusive disjunction. So, in other words, if we just stick with what is said, it might turn out that it's not so obvious that the or in English is exclusive. But in context, it might very clearly communicate that just one of these two things is true and not both. So, it's not just that he's saying there's more to language than just semantics. He's also saying paying attention to this other stuff, the stuff about not just what's said, but what is what further things are communicated, or if you like, how we can use language, how we can use certain sentences that literally say certain things to communicate certain further other things. Um, that can illuminate arguments about semantics. If we can identify um, what sentences, oh, I'm kicking things, sorry. If we, can if we can identify what sentences can be used to do, that can help us um, get clearer about uh, what they literally say. Here's an example. Uh, I should have done this before. Uh, here's an example of an or sentence that uh, I think it probably feels as clearly as anything um, as an exclusive or. If somebody says, you can have super salad, like in a restaurant or something. Remember restaurants? Um, they probably mean just one. You don't get, you probably have to pay extra if you want both. But we might say, look, the or, as far as the, the sentence itself is concerned, the person might be saying something that, you know, is literally true if you have both things. But in context, we know as a matter of like background information that uh, like maybe there's even something on the menu that says um, each, uh, each item under here comes with one side of your choice, one side dish of your choice. In that case, I don't need to tell you with my or sentence that you can only have one of, one of these two things. I've already told you that. Okay. So just to make this, just to make a slightly finer point on the distinction between semantics and pragmatics, because there will be, um, I, I'm not going to give you questions on the exam that are directly just like, tell me about Grice, but there will be questions where I say, uh, consider semantics as opposed to pragmatics, or pragmatic as opposed to semantic explanations of one of the other questions we're going to look at. So let's try and put a pin on this. Um, two sorts of inquiry into language. Semantics, 
roughly speaking, we might characterize as asking, how do words or sentences come to mean what they mean? What do they literally mean this is about what is said? Pragmatics, we might ask, how do we use words or sentences to convey what we want to convey, to communicate what we want to communicate? And here we might care about something like conversational implicature. Um, I, I am definitely emphasizing the word roughly here when I say here's roughly how to think about semantics and how to think about pragmatics. Um, exactly what the boundary is between these two things is extremely controversial among linguists and philosophers of language. Um, but broadly speaking, if you think of semantics as about what is said, as about uh, what exactly um, the, the, if you like, literal meanings of sentences are, and how that happens, if you think of it as fundamentally concerned with truth conditions, when a sentence is literally true, um, when it's literally false, uh, you won't be far off. And if you think of pragmatics as about the rest, other things that um, we might want to communicate by means of such sentences and words, then you'll be pretty okay. So um, here's another way that we can think about this. People sometimes distinguish between word meaning or sentence meaning on the one hand and speaker meaning on the other. So we can ask, what does that sentence mean? Or we can ask, what did that speaker mean? We might want to say, so like, in this case, the sentence I've got an early class tomorrow morning just means tomorrow morning I have a class. It doesn't mean anything about pubs. But if we want to ask, what did B mean when B said this thing? We might want to say, oh, B means they're not coming. So on the one hand, We've got um, questions about uh, word meaning or sentence meaning. Those look semantic. And then we've got questions about speaker meaning. Those look more pragmatic. The Grice stuff that you're reading is all about pragmatics. Everybody else that we're going to read in this class is thinking primarily about semantic questions. Although at the very end, the last thing we're going to read, the Jennifer Saul article, um, considers both semantic and pragmatic explanations of uh, phenomena that previously um, the, the other readings that you've got uh, considered to be semantic. Okay, this is long enough. I'm going to stop there. Uh, I'll talk to you guys soon.